Good morning to everyone. We're having an outdoor service here at North Seattle Alliance Church. This is a special day. Several of our, our youth will be baptized today in Holler Lake. What a wonderful time to celebrate and worship the Lord in his beautiful creation. God calls us to be grateful. The psalmist in Psalms 107 calls the congregation to give thanks to the Lord. As we worship today, whether we're from home or here assembled together, we know that God is with us. The selected verses from Psalms 107, the psalmist reads, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he satisfies the thirsty and he fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. Others went out to sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke, he stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, for you are our Redeemer and our Savior. To you we cry out in our distress, especially in these times, dear Lord, we desperately need you as our Savior. Thank you for hearing our hearts cry. Thank you for being there through your Son, Jesus Christ. Enable us to know you more fully, no matter the situation that we're in. We thank you and praise you for you are glorious. Thank you for what you are about to do this day. Be with each one. Encourage us. Lift us up. Help us go out from here proclaiming you, Savior and Lord, that the nations, all the peoples, may worship you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand together and worship.
I'm surrendered. And I'm surrendered to your love. Forever humbled by the message of the cross. I stand abandoned in your presence and embrace. I'll never be the same, oh God. Your love. Your love is alive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Your love is like fire burning within us, drawing us closer to you. That's our prayer. That's our desire, is that we would grow closer and closer to you because we belong to you and because you love us so much. Heavenly Father, we praise you on this beautiful day in your beautiful creation. We're reminded that you are the creator of heaven and earth. You are God of the universe. You hold everything in the palm of your hand. You are great, you're powerful, and yet you love us and you care for us. Lord, you know our fears, our concerns, our anxieties. We pray that as we worship you today, that you would remind us in a powerful way that, Lord, you are God, you are in control, you are sovereign, you are in charge, you are trustworthy, and that we could trust you no matter what circumstance we are facing. Lord, we pray for the six young people who are getting baptized today. We're so proud of them for this step of faith that they're taking in their journey. 
we praise you for working in their lives. We trust you that you will continue to guide them and provide for them till the very end. Heavenly Father, we pray for the entire service today from the beginning to the end that your will will be done. Your word will be spoken through Pastor Bob and that you will receive all the glory. And now we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. It is a pleasure to speak to you by the shores of Holler Lake. We're reminded quite visibly that the church does not need to be confined in the four walls of a building, but that in fact, we can go out into worship. We are unleashed to live our faith out in the world. So I wanna encourage you to keep thinking of creative ways to live out our faith, even as we take safety measures and find ways to be healthy. So we are continuing our By Faith series and unpacking the aspects of faith as demonstrated by the pantheon of faith found in the book of Hebrew chapter 11. So we've been challenged to give God a better offering. We've thought about what it means to be obedient in holy fear. Pastor Solomon spoke last, a couple weeks ago, about how Abraham's faith was tested and he was willing to offer up everything to God to show that he loved him more than anything else. Last week, Minister Eckert spoke on Jacob and Esau's story and how as children of promise, they waited for the hope of God to be realized. Today, we'll look at Moses and how his faith guided him in the choices he made and how that made all the difference for him. So before we start, let's ask God to be with us and to prepare our hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, this Lord's Day, where we're able to gather in worship and praise of you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll unite us as we listen to your word, illuminate our hearts and minds so that we may hear fully the truth you have for our lives. Lord, help us not to be merely listeners, but also doers of your words of love, grace, and mercy. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's passage is found in Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 27. If you're able, can I invite you to rise and read with me? Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. We see from this passage that faith spoke into three aspects of Moses' life. His identity, his sense of value, and finally, his vision. My hope for you is that you'll consider and reflect on whether your faith informs and forms these areas of your life. So first, identity. Moses is a large figure in our faith. He is credited with writing the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And these books are considered foundational for our understanding of Creator God. When we think about Moses, we often think of a powerful figure. I think of the Charlton Heston character, powerful, authoritative, with wild hair, 
speaking with God's words. But this actually isn't the full picture of who Moses, who Moses was. I've shared this before when we talked about our Moses series, but Moses' life can actually be divided up in three segments of 40 years. He spent 40 years in the palace of Pharaoh as the adopted child of Pharaoh's daughter. He spent 40 years hiding in Midian, building a life as a shepherd, working for his father-in-law. At 80 years old, he was called by God to be the deliverer of God's people. He spent the next 40 years leading Israel through the desert in the promised land. In his life, Moses had many different experiences. He was rich, he was poor, he was treated as royalty, he did manual labor. He lived in a palace and he lived in a tent, roaming in a desert. But before he can get to this point, Moses had to answer this question of identity. Who are you? Let my people go. Moses was born under the wildest circumstances. When he was born, it was decreed that all male children would be put to death. Brothers and sisters, this is a foreshadow of Herod's similar decree at the birth of Jesus, who would be the deliverer for all of humanity. We read in Exodus that his parents took bold actions to save Moses. In fact, in Hebrews 11 verse 23, it, is said, it was said that by faith they hid him, choosing to trust in God rather than fearing the king. This act of faith was part of God's plan for Moses. But let's unpack the situation a little bit. It says that Moses was first identified as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This would mean he would be in line to succeed Pharaoh if he would embrace this identity. Now, as a parent, this sounds perfect, doesn't it? Your child would live. More than that, your child wouldn't have to worry again. He'd be safe, he'd be secure, never have to worry because he had status, he had money, and he had power. Doesn't that sound perfect? Well, brothers and sisters, the answer is no. God had much more in plan. He had much more in mind for what Moses would do, more than just this palace life. But this sentiment actually reminds me of... Um, a website or, or a, a Facebook group that I'm a, I'm a part of. Uh, last December, one of the college students uh, invited me to join Subtle Asian Traits. It's a Facebook group um, that gathers Asians and people who love Asians, I guess. This group celebrates and laments the shared Asian experience, especially among Asians who have spread out into other countries and cultures like America, Canada, Australia. Now, one of the recurring themes that is shared from uh, all the different people on this site is this idea of living up to the expectations of Asian parents. So this cartoon that I'm showing here, I'm sure a lot of students and young people can relate to. It is a mother speaking to her daughter about her future career. Now, this, this mother sounds like she's pretty open, she says, you can be whatever you want to be, as long as it's a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a businesswoman. The joke, of course, is that Asian parents care too much about a good career that their child should have over maybe the well-being of the child or even the desire of the child. Do I hear any amens right now from the young people? Now, to be clear, it is not wrong to hope for the best for your children. But the slippery slope I observe here is that when our hopes and desires are prioritized over God's will or plans for our lives, that's when it becomes a problem. When the identity we seek for our children is centered around career or status, it becomes a problem. Think about it. How often do we describe people by what they do? We say, oh, that's Danny, he's a doctor. Or we say, Sharon, she's a pharmacist. Or that's Josh, he's a system design engineer. Very rarely do we, de do we describe people by the quality of their faith or, or how they 
are in church. When our identity is founded in these worldly things, in how much money a person earns, how prestigious their job is, how much power they possess, this is much less than what God has in mind for us as well. The real question of identity, who are you, should speak to the heart of the person. It should reveal your foundation, your values. It is more than just what you do. And that's what Moses was facing here when he had this identity crisis. He could be known as Moses, the grandson of Pharaoh, and all that that would entail, the status, the authority, the power, the money. But it says in verse 24 that he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And it continues in Hebrews 11.25 that he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. Moses refused one identity and chose another. He chose to identify instead with the people of God, the Hebrews, slaves, low status, no power. Now, why would he choose that? What, what is it about refusing the, the pleasure and choosing mistreatments that God honored as faithful. We learn from Moses' story that to identify with Pharaoh was to choose defiance and disobedience to God's way and God's command. Egypt represented the trappings and temptations of a comfortable life that is devoid of God, where God does not rule, where security and power is found in wealth, and in wealth and power. Conversely, the identity of being part of the people of God comes with mistreatment because it goes against the power and authority of the world and presents a new way of thinking. We see, brothers and sisters, that in this way, Moses is actually seen as a foreshadow of Christ Jesus, our ultimate deliverer. Jesus came to save all people, not as a conquering ruler, but as the perfect sacrificial lamb. Jesus chose the way of suffering. And it is by his suffering, by his blood, that all people can be reconciled and redeemed. Jesus chose the way of suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. He took that cup and prayed that not his will be done, but God's will be done. Brothers and sisters, this is our identity too. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. We are called to refuse worldly identity and to join in the identity as God's people, as children of God, as co-heirs with Christ. This identity this identification supersedes all other identities. It is our foundational identity. So when someone asks me, who are you? My first answer must be that I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's above being Bob, the IG husband, Bob, the father of Noah and Naomi, Bob, the Canadian, even Pastor Bob. I am first and foremost, Bob Doe, a child of God a follower of Christ. Amen? Brothers and sisters, how do you identify yourself? What do you need to refuse and what do you need to choose so that your faith reflects the identity that God has for you in Christ Jesus? Now, often at the root of this identity crisis is a subtle desire for control. We strive for these types of jobs because of the security that it brings us financially, or the status that it gives us. These measures of value are us actually making a value judgment, which brings me to the next point. How do we understand value? Now, I believe we've all been brought up with a sense of value, haven't we? To appreciate the good things in life. I remember when my family would go to the buffet, this value judgment would come out. Automatically, you have to walk past all the salads and all the carbs. That's just filler. You got to keep your eye on the prize. 
You got to look for the expensive stuff. That means seafood. That means prime ribs. Don't settle for, for soup. Don't, don't settle for fried items. That's just going to needlessly fill you. You got to get at least three plates. And, and, and that's how you win at the buffet. This is our value judgment, isn't it? Now, I remember when I took my son Noah to the buffet, and he would want to just fill his plate with macaroni and cheese. The cheapest thing and the most filling thing. It hurt my heart to see him make this kind of choice. I felt like I failed as a parent. I couldn't instill the right kind of value into my son. How about you? How do you, what do you measure value by? Do you look at how much something costs? What the quality of something is? Have you heard of this saying, buy nice or buy twice? That means if you don't buy nice, chances are whatever you buy is going to break and you'll have to buy it again. So it speaks to the quality of the things that you buy. Unfortunately, Eunice reminds me of this saying more than I care to admit. But this idiom speaks towards a value judgment about the things we consume. Brothers and sisters, it isn't a huge step for us to go from buying what we need to all of a sudden buying what we want. That's an easy step, is it? isn't it? So my question is, what do you value? Again, I want to say it's not bad for us to have things in our lives. It's not bad for us to strive for good paying jobs. The question is, how are you prioritizing these things in your life? What value, what place does it have? Moses in Hebrew 11, verse 25 to 26, made choices. Let's look at the parts of these verses and see what it teaches us that's at the foundation of what Moses valued. It says in verse 25, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of, of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So there's two words there that stood out to me, pleasures and treasures. Now, on the surface, it would seem absurd to choose mistreatment and disgrace over pleasures and treasures. Pleasurable things are easy to want. Why, why would you not want pleasure? Treasures are easy to desire. It gives you access to more pleasures. Why would you choose suffering over these things? It just it just doesn't make sense, right? But brothers and sisters, the gospel has always challenged our sense of what valuable means. It has always gone against the wisdom of the world, hasn't it? It speaks of a God that leaves 99 sheep in order to look for one. It teaches parables that talk about selling everything in order to possess just a pearl. And this goes beyond possessions too. This same God never valued kings or kingdoms. Rather, this God, Jesus, cared about orphans. He cared about widows, those whom society has deemed to have no value. This Jesus invited children to come to listen. He cared about foreigners, prostitutes, and tax collectors. Brothers and sisters, this was absurd. But let's dig deeper and see what Moses was choosing instead of pleasures and treasures. In verse 25, it says that Moses valued his identity as being a part of God's people over the fleeting pleasures of sin. In verse 26, it says he acts for Christ's sake over his regard for Egypt's treasure. So we see here that Moses valued his relationship with God above the fleeting pleasures or treasures of the world. So this wasn't about Moses choosing something. This was about Moses choosing someone. Moses was choosing relationship with God over anything that Pharaoh and his kingdom could offer. In light of his relationship with God, even earthly disgrace, for Christ's sake, is of greater value than gold, silver, or precious stones. Now, I just want to do a quick aside. Some of you might be wondering, how can Moses do something for Christ's sake? The quick answer 
is typological exegesis. You can Google what that means. Or you can email me and we could talk about what it means for Moses to do something for Christ's sake. Okay, let's continue. Now, as I said earlier, that any worldly sense, that by any worldly sense, the choices that Moses made would have seemed absurd or incomprehensible. But Moses was not making his value judgment by any earthly wisdom. Rather, he was demonstrating a heavenly wisdom, one that had an eternal perspective. He saw that the things of God are eternal and well above the earthly and mundane things that are temporary. Matthew 16, 26 says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? The Bible is clear. When you ask the question of what do you value, what do you care about, what is it that you lift up, our value must be established on the eternal things of God. We can only understand true value through our relationship with Jesus. Amen? Finally, we're going to talk about vision. So, but before we go on, I just want to say that's a little bit of a challenge for us, right, brothers and sisters? That, that last lesson from Moses, we know the pleasures of sin is temporary. We know earthly treasures will not last, but we are still tempted, whether it's the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, or the pride of life. The seduction of temporary indulgences are strong, and so often it is so easy for us to give in. This is where it is vitally important for us to understand where our focus is. Brothers and sisters, if we visit the same websites, if we put ourselves, if we continuously put ourselves in tempting situations, if we're constantly chasing a certain number in our bank account, or always chasing after the latest style or the latest gadgets, we'll, we'll find ourselves constantly tested by the pleasures and treasures of the world. Moses teaches us in Hebrews 11 that by faith, his identity and value was founded in God. And that was a foundational shift, moving from an earthly point of view to a godly point of view. It changed Moses' perspective and his outlook. Hebrews 11, 26 to 27 talks about how he looked ahead and that he saw him who was invisible. Moses looked ahead and Moses saw him who was invisible. Now, some of you may know I'm an amateur photographer. I like seeing and learning photography from people who are much better than myself. And one of my favorite kinds of pictures are night, phot night photographs, mostly of stars. The coolest thing about star photos is that when you look at the sky and you see stars, there's actually so many more than what the naked eye can see. These stars are invisible because our eyes are not sensitive enough to see the light that they're emitting. So you need something like a camera with a long exposure that can, that can take time to absorb that light and capture a starscape that gives us a much grander magnitude of God's creation. We, we see the majesty of how many stars there are in the sky. Now, I want you to understand a few things about these stars. The sun is actually considered an average size star. And in its average sizeness, it still releases 3.8 times 10 to the 26th power joules of luminosity per second. In terms of mass, that's 4 million tons of energy every second. This is considered an average size star. Some of the faint stars that we can't see with our own eyes are actually, some of them are actually 100 times larger than the sun. That is to say, some of these stars, even though they're invisible, is way beyond our understanding. They are so powerful. They are so awesome. This is the image I have in mind when I read this verse. Moses was looking ahead at his reward, and he saw him who was invisible. God is so much more awesome and powerful than we can ever possibly comprehend. This is the same God that Moses was able to see by faith. 
He was able to see the power and awesomeness of God, him who was invisible because of his faith. This vision helped Moses to press on through suffering and and mistreatment. The prize that he saw with his eyes of faith was a God who is infinitely more valuable than anything that the world has to offer. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the same God, this powerful, wonderful God who desires to be in relationship with each of us. How often do we turn away from God because we just don't see him in our lives? But brothers and sisters, like the stars, God is there. It is with eyes of faith that we can see him who is invisible and persevere on the path that he has given us. Moses teaches us that faith was keeping his eyes on God, keeping his vision pointed towards God. Likewise, Hebrew 12, 2 calls us, encourages us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, we are called to press on by keeping our vision, our eyes fixed on Jesus. It is in this process that God can guide and direct us in life's journey. Brothers and sisters, these are the lessons of faith that we see in Moses' life. Moses' faith helped him to refuse the world and choose an identity in God. His faith helped redefine value, not by earthly standards, but by God's standard. And finally, his faith kept his eyes fixed upon God, which gave him direction and insight for decisions in his life. So as we sing this response song together, can I invite you to reflect on where you have placed your identity? What is it that you have prioritized and valued over Jesus? For some of us, we need to turn back to Jesus. Can I invite you to turn your eyes on Jesus and let him be your direction and your guide? Take time to reflect, brothers and sisters, and make things right if you need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lesson you have given us through your servant Moses. Lord, we know that Moses pointed us toward the greater gift of Jesus Christ, who died so that we could be made right with you. So Lord, move us. Help us to die to the things in our life. Help us to refuse the things that are not of you. Help us to choose you. Help us to center ourselves on you and let our lives be given to your leading, to your will. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll stand for the response. Oh soul, oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see.
everyone. My name is Abigail and I currently attend CG Fellowship. It is such an honor and blessing to introduce Daniel for his baptism today. I have known Daniel my whole life for over 20 years. We have been lifelong friends and have grown up together in ECC. Throughout the years, I have seen Daniel's caring heart and altruistic spirit towards others. He is one of the kindest people I know. For example, ever since we have been quarantined, Daniel has faithfully made his handmade sourdough bread and delivered it to our family. He always has cared to take the time to drive to our house and drop off the bread, even if it's out of his way. I have also seen his character quality of patience, being slow to speak and always listening well. Growing up, I have never really understood how sports are played, how stocks work, or how to compute basic math equations. Daniel has always been patient with me, explaining that the Seahawks jersey colors are green and navy, that AMD stock options are the best, and that I can calculate tips by moving the decimal point one space over. I am excited to see you take the next big step in your relationship with God. God is smiling upon you on this special day, and may your baptism be the solid foundation that anchors and supports your lifelong relationship with God. Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. For those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Wang. Ever since I can remember, God has been a part of my life. But I've never felt like I needed him. I'm blessed with a family that supports me, friends that are always willing to listen, and teachers who are happy to guide me. I knew in my mind that God is real, that the words written in the Bible are true. But I didn't feel why God's love was important, and more importantly, I didn't think I needed it. Moving into college, I got swept up by life. Sometimes I had minor issues, but I told myself I could overcome them just by trying my hardest. I've always struggled asking for help, and as I spent more time working on school and other commitments, I began to lose contact with the people who supported me in the past. After a breakup, on top of everything else, the days began to feel like a struggle. I felt like I was in a whirlpool, getting pulled deeper and deeper, but even so, I refused to ask for help. One night, I was laying in bed, and I knew I just couldn't go on anymore. And in a moment of desperation, I called on Jesus' name. After that point, that was the only instant in my life that I truly meant it. And instantly, I felt a calm come over me. I felt like an embrace, and my world stopped spinning. God never stopped pursuing me. While taking first step, Auntie Jenny asked me to ask God to reveal himself to me and to pray with intention, purpose, and an expectation of a response. I started to see all the big and little ways that God has blessed my life. The setbacks and disappointments like God were saying, I have a better plan. I also began to see a taste of how Jesus sees people, not with hate for their shortcomings, but with love for their gifts and a perspective for their struggles. I'm going to end by sharing a Bible verse. Psalm 23, 6 says, Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. Daniel, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I do. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? I do. Do you vow to do your very best to be a follower of Jesus Christ? 
I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hi everyone, my name's Emily. I'm here today to introduce Jackie. Um, we're all so proud of her. Um, if you guys haven't met Jackie before, she's the daughter of Auntie Victoria and she's the big sister to her baby brother, Luke. And Jackie is just such a special person. Um, I've known her since I was her wife counselor when she was in sixth grade. And I've gotten to see her grow over the years and I've gotten to counsel her in YSF for the past three years. And Jackie is just someone who is very genuine, um, very joyful, and just a really kind and gentle person. Um, yeah, she's a light in her community and she just makes everyone in the room really happy when she walks in. Um, so very proud that she's getting baptized today. So here's Jackie. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie and I'll be sharing my testimony with all of you. I started attending ECC when I was three years old and it has been my home church, home church ever since. When I was little, I'd always loved going to church to attend children's worship on Sundays, to sing songs to God and Sunday school to learn miraculous stories about Him and what He has done. Learning so much about Him and what He has done at a young age played a great significance in my acceptance of Him as my Lord and Savior. Vacation Bible schools in the summer were always fun to go to as well with friends to learn more about how much God truly loves us all. And I also can't, I also can't forget about the many memories I made at Kids Club and at several youth group events. But as I got older, I started to feel as if going to church has just been a weekly routine for me. I'd go to church service, then Sunday school, eat lunch with my friends, go to choir, and then go home. Sometimes it felt like I only devoted my time to God on the weekends. When middle school came around, I started to have thoughts and hard questions for people to answer about what I believe in, Christianity. But I will forever be thankful for my freshman Bible teacher, Miss Amble, who gave me so much clarity per by providing me with historical evidence that Jesus is real. One thing that she said that I will always remember is that Christianity is not a religion of do's and don'ts, but rather it is a personal relationship with God the Creator. She rooted and grounded my faith strongly in Christ, and from then on I was invested in learning more about God and continually growing my faith and relationship with Him. Another thing that has helped me during this time was a verse from the Bible that has become my favorite verse, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I love this verse because it reminds me that God is my rock and my foundation, and He is always there for me. When I was a junior in high school, I felt a strong calling from God. My school would have chapels every Friday where each time um, where they would bring different guest speakers each time to talk about the many ways God has impacted their life or the lives of others. After hearing many of these stories, it inspired me to do something about my faith. So I decided to go to Mexico with our missions team last summer. When I was there, I met some amazing people who have shown me that God is doing good things all around the world. It, has, it was also so refreshing to see Jesus working the lives of so many people. Today, I want to confirm my faith in Christ by getting baptized because I want everyone to know that he has made a difference in my life and that I want to live a meaningful life for Christ, um, knowing that my life has a purpose. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior because he died for me and he truly cares about me. Doing devotions, listening to different sermons, and singing praises to him has helped me stay rooted and grow my faith and relationship with him. Many of my friends and family members have also helped me during my faith journey and I'm excited for and I'm truly grateful for all of them. I'm excited to take this next step in my spiritual journey by publicly proclaiming my faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Okay. 
that you do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sin? Yes, I do. Do you vow to do your very best to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes, I do. Jackie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hi, I'm John, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gabriel. And um, yeah, Gabriel is the youngest of uh, three boys, and when he first uh, came into YSF, I just thought that, oh, here's another boy that looks like Uncle Danny. But uh, yeah, he's been amazing. Uh, he's, he's such a calm, he, he shows such a calm influence to everybody around him in YSF. And especially this year, he's, he's shown a lot of resilience, um, yeah, going through up and, ups and downs. So yeah, I'm very proud of him. And here's uh, Gabriel. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel, but uh, some of you might know me as Yo-Yo. Uh, I grew up at ECC. Uh, some of my most fond memories were from youth ministry, Awana, and VBS. I accepted Jesus as my personal savior when I was eight years old, um, with my mom guiding me through prayer. I understood and believed that Jesus Christ was uh, the greatest sac made the greatest sacrifice of all and died for our sins. And it wasn't until high school where I felt two periods in my, in my life changed my attitude as a Christian. So I had the opportunity to serve on the missions team to Dr. Royal Mexico last summer. So I'm actually fluent in Spanish as I studied in an immersion program from elementary school to through high school. So I was able to help translate for my team and interact with the local missionaries and the people in Dr. Royal. And I really felt that God was using my abilities to spread his word and his love. And throughout the, tr throughout the trip, I could see how God was using each member's unique talents on our very young team. I also realized that even though the people of Mexico lived a life so different from mine, we all shared the same love for God despite our differences. The second period in my life where I felt that God was changing my perspective was just this past winter. I'd lost my grandpa that November so suddenly. Shortly after, I'd experienced several broken relationships and the sudden death of another friend. I questioned why God had taken so much away from me. I felt hopeless and broken, but this brokenness drew me cl closer to him. I sought out for guidance from older mentors in the church and put my faith in the Lord. Even though I still might not understand God's timing, I trusted in his promise and his love for me. While I'll never be a perfect Christian, I decided to get baptized today as a public profession of my faith. It is my declaration to continue to do my very best to spread God's love and word while continuing to trust in him. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My, my heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. Thank you. Gabriel, I'm going to ask you three questions. You can respond with yes or I do. First, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I do. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? I do. Do you promise to do your very best with the help of the Holy Spirit to live as a follower of Christ? I do. Gabriel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, um, I'll be introducing Eve today. Uh, Eve and I grew up in the church together, and it's such an honor to be friends and sisters in Christ uh, together. 
Uh, like many of the kids that grew up in church, we grew up listening to various Bible stories um, through Sunday school lessons. And as we've matured, uh, I've come to see Eve become a strong woman of Christ and in faith as she continues to spread the Lord's love and grace through everyday actions. Um, she's so kind-hearted and always open to discussion about faith. And whenever she speaks, she's very honest and loving, and she's just such a joy to be around and spend time with. Uh, Eve has always been a loving sister to me and willing to help me through all my trials and struggles in faith. And she's been such a great support of mine, and I'm so excited and happy for her to take this next step in her faith. Um, may the Lord bless this day of your baptism, and I hope that you use this as an anchor in your faith. Hello, my name is Eve, and I figured I'd start today off with my favorite Bible passage. So, I'll be reading from Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace, in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also um, boast glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. To me, baptism has always been a daunting and vulnerable experience in front of crowds of people, and regardless of how ready I might have felt, felt in my faith, I was still afraid. And so I consider myself lucky that as my friends signed up for the first step class, they encouraged me to do the same. My friends at church have always been a safe place for me, and they've helped me grow a lot in hard times in my life. From junior high up, I began to have rough time, um, have a rough time with unkind peers at school, and it caused me to struggle a lot with anger and stress. Then, I, then at a youth camp in my ninth grade year, the pastor held an altar call to be prayed over by counselors and peers. And although I didn't step up myself, I became very emotional. And my friends came around to hug and pray for me anyways. I remember that night, I felt incredibly safe and at ease, more so than I had ever before, and so I wanted to keep that air bubble feeling, um, and I've known to come it as a spiritual high. Um, so I seek it now every time I am in need or when I'm frustrated or sad or pained with anything. So since then I've become less, e less easily agitated or paranoid, um, and I know that because I'm now not running on my own fumes, but um, I can seek help and rest to being more powerful and wise than I am. It's very comforting to me. And still there are times when I get overwhelmed and my faith shakes. And in those moments, my friends become all the more important to me, reminding me where I stand and the comfort that surrounds me. I remember once Pastor Bob preached about how Christianity is like a triangle. And as we as a community grow closer to each other in our faith, we also grow closer to God. And that's something that stuck with me a long time. Being baptized away from the main body of church is a little bit disappointing, but I think that it's alright, and it maybe is God giving me that little bit of breathing room to not be so nervous. Um, still, through faith and the friends that have brought me here, being baptized before God makes me incredibly happy, and I'm very happy to be here. You thought we were laundry? <laughs> True. Good work. Why is there laundry? I don't know. We won't. Alright, so I'm going to ask you three questions. You can respond with yes or I do. Eve, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Eve, do you promise to do your very best with the help of the Holy Spirit to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Eve, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi everyone, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Heather and I'm introducing Kimberly today. Um, I've gotten to know Kimberly over the last year, counseling her in YSF. Um, one thing that I always appreciate about Kimberly is how she's um, always willing to ask questions and just explore her faith deeper. Um, even when she's not sure about um, things or if she's struggling, she's always open and honest about where she is. Um, she just has such a loving 
um, and bubbly personality, and she just spreads the joy of the Lord wherever she is. Um, if you've ever interacted with Kimberly, you were probably laughing about something silly that she did or said. Um, so yeah, I'm just really proud of everything that she's um, gone through this year and grown in um, and just taking the next step. And I know God's going to use her to do amazing things. Hello, my name is Kimberly. Um, growing up in a Christian household and being raised as a Christian, I was taught many things in Sunday school and at home. One of the things that I learned early on was that God could perform miracles and that I could always rely on God whenever, uh, whenever I was going through a hard time. As a little girl and even towards my pre-teenage years, I thought that miracles only happened to a select number of people and that I, could, I would never see a miracle happen in my lifetime. And growing up, I knew and I believed that God would always be there through my hard times. It wasn't until I encountered some trials in my life that I needed real miracles and problems that I couldn't face alone that I really understood the meaning to those Sunday school lessons. In my life, I've seen my brother go through sickness with no known cure. I've seen my friend go through countless days in the hospital from a heart disease, and I've gotten to understand the feeling of loss from a death of another friend. I knew that in these obstacles that I needed a miracle to happen. And at the time, I didn't understand the reason why God put so many trials um, one after the other, and I didn't know why this was God's plan for me. It wasn't until I heard a sermon talk about why God puts trials in our lives because it makes us draw closer to him that I understood why God had put these obstacles in front of me. Through the hard times, I finally understood what it meant to put all my faith and trust in God, and so I did. I didn't know or realize it then, but through it all, God was there with me, as he provided me with amazing opportunities to focus on other things and events despite everything that was happening. And he gave me friends and family to comfort me in these hard times. He also provided me with um, amazing miracles to the people that I needed to get better. Since then, I have grown in my trust in the Lord and what his plans will be for me in the future. Although I don't know what my future will have in store for me, I know that I'll be okay through it all because I know that God has a plan and that he will always be there whenever I need him. Um, lastly, I have a verse uh, from 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight on weaknesses, in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Thank you. Go, Kimmy! There's a step. What you can do is kind of squat a little bit. Kimberly, I'm going to ask you three questions. You can respond with I do. Do you believe that Jesus? is the Son of God. I do. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? I do. Do you vow to do your very best with the help of the Holy Spirit to live as a follower of Christ? I Kimberly, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Jenny, and I'm here to introduce Audrey. And Audrey, I noticed her, but I did not know her long ago when she was always playing at the piano. So I saw this little girl who was always at the piano, and lo and behold, there she is. And I expect her to be studying music, like a parent, okay? But then she ended up in engineering. And one of the connections I have with her and find out, she actually attended the first step class a few years, a couple of years ago. But she decided she wanted to wait until she really know what she is proclaiming. So today, and she is taking the step to get baptized, and I'm sure I let her share her stories. And she had really have a good connect, uh, um, relationship with the Lord through her college year in Biola. And because she went to the, she's going to the same school as my daughter went, 
So that's a special connection for her too. Uh, here it is, Audrea. Although growing up in a Christian household and being in church my whole life, for me, I didn't really realize what it meant to be truly a Christian until I had left and started college in 2018. I had grow, grown up knowing that I was a daughter of God and that God had plans for each and every one of us, and all we need to do is believe, but it never felt real to me. I chose to identify myself first as a student, and in high school, I became obsessed with creating this perfect image of a good student, a girl that was in charge of various clubs, won national competitions, interned at universities and software companies, and strived for the approval of my classmates, friends, and family through the grades I brought home, the medals and trophies, and internship offers. For me, it wasn't about being able, to, it wasn't about being secure in the fundamental identity I had learned in Sunday school, but rather for gaining worldly approval. But even as I won these competitions and interned re and received high grades, I felt so empty. I always like to find it funny how I ended up at Biola. I had applied to two of my dream schools only to receive rejection. I felt so angry at God my senior year because I had spent all four years working so hard to receive the acceptance letters I had wanted, but they never came. It was hard for me to accept that fact, but for some reason, God was pushing me to look at Biola, the school I had applied to as a mere safety. As time went on, I ultimately fought my parents quite hard to be able to attend Biola, and that's where I think my journey really took off. The first time I stepped onto campus in April 2018, I was almost moved to tears because I had just felt God's presence around me on that campus. In sophomore year, I had the privilege of taking a Gospel of John class, which really helped me discover who I am in Christ and who Christ is to me. In John 4, Jesus approaches a Samaritan woman who seems to be harmlessly drawing water, but he knows more. He knows who she is, a woman already seen as second class and unclean, a Samaritan, a for foreigner and considered a menstruant from the cradle, and a sinner because of her sexually impure past with five husbands and one man. She has three strikes in this time period and is supposed to be out according to the world, but not with Jesus. He, provi he provides her an opportunity, living water straight from God to cleanse. Cleansing wasn't through water purification from the jars in the wedding in John 2, nor through the temple sacrifices in John 2 as well. I know that I do not gain favor in God's eyes for my paper achievements, the grades I receive, or the approval I have from the world. John's flow of the gospel ultimately points towards the culmination of the journey of how do I become clean and leads up to this moment. He offers to remove this lady's sin, sin and shame and restore her with honor. The living water he offers her means quality and quantity. Her life will be changed and it will last for forever. He gives her this living water so that this outcast can become a source of eternal life for others. She brings her town to believe in him and she is the first evangelist and missionary we see in John. And that has truly struck with me since learning the power of the passage and the power of Jesus himself. Looking at this knowledge I had gained just this past fall and comparing it to my life, I began just to see how much God had blessed me, how much he had kept me close even when I was so far. All my achievements, although done in vain and personal gain in high school, had set me up to be able to go to Berkeley in summer 2019, where I had done the most self-growth because of the geographical transition and loss I had experienced during that time period. When I was alone, he comforted me. When I had to travel back for a funeral ab abruptly, he was there to comfort me and provided me with friends and a church community in Berkeley for me to be able to be vulnerable and honest with. And even returning to Biola in fall 2019, he had placed me in my Gospel of John class where he could speak to me. Nothing I have done in my life, now being able to look back, has been done on my own strength. Maybe I had my own agenda in high school, but because he allowed for all these events to line up perfectly, this brought me to Biola, brought me to these life experiences and trials, and truly looking back, I can say that God has been my anchor for the past six years of my high school and college life. It's so amazing to witness that yes, even through the events I have gone through, God is using these experiences to heal me and to teach me what I have never heard before. Even though we go through transitions, heartbreak and loss, God is using these experiences to heal and teach what we have never heard before. Every event we go through will be used for his glory. Goodness is truly found in God, Peace is truly found in God, and he is the only hole that can fill any need of self-worth in my life. I now know what it means to be fully believe in God, to fully put my trust, love, and my passion in a God who is real, the one who heals and knows everything I have gone through and will go through. I see him as the one thing I can anchor myself deeply to when life hits hard. I know that even in my brokenness, I have Christ, and he continues to guide me. Through fall 2019, I challenged myself to post about my God sightings and passage readings to my Instagram story for my followers to read. 
Most of my followers aren't Christian, and I wasn't sure how they'd react. I started praying over my close friends every night that weren't Christian. Whether or not I can see God working, I know that I have been gifted so much from Him, so what stopped me from sharing? What is holding me back from being more open and transparent about this free gift that offers so, so much? There are so many people I'd like to name and thank for guiding me all these years and for the growth I've experienced in Christ. First, I'd like to thank my family for providing me with love and showing me what it means to serve God in His calling. I'd like to thank Joanne Wong and Winnie Chin for listening to me and for loving me and for seeing me past my brokenness in high school. I'd like to thank my professors at Biola for their instruction and their love and their openness to hear from me and about me, and for my roommate Sarah, who has taught me so much about opening up and setting an amazing example for what it means to listen to God and put Him first. I'd like to thank my church community here at ECC for the care they have shown me, Living Water Church in Berkeley for the immense love and community I experienced for three months, and to Anchor Community Church, where I have truly found people I can trust in and people to support my growth. And last, thank you to God for being a good God who loves me unconditionally, who doesn't give up on me even in my stubbornness, and for always taking me in back again. Thank you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you vow to do your very best with the help of the Holy Spirit to live your life as a follower of Christ? Audrey, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Good morning once again. This is the time normally at our worship service where we'll be meeting together, where we would ask those of you who had brought newcomers to introduce them to us. We know that while we're worshiping distantly, we don't have a, that opportunity, but we do have the opportunity to send out to those we know links to the worship service. So do be reminded that we can still invite our friends. We can still invite non-believers to worship with us. Wherever we're meeting and worshiping in our homes, we do we do hope then and trust that the Lord is blessing you and he's keeping you. Turning to the announcements, we want to be reminded to pray for those deacon and deaconess candidates that have come forward, those who will be a part of the church council in various congregations starting in the fall. Please take a look at the bulletin online and keep them in your prayers. We also want to remind you that we have a leadership training series coming up starting September 20th. And there's a sign up link online. If you are uh, currently considering being a small group leader, please take a look there and follow the link and do sign up. Again, we, we wanna continue praying and supporting one another and being creative during the summertime, enabling us to meet outdoors in various ways in smaller groups while social distancing. So be creative, get together, enjoy one another, enjoy God's creation. Lord bless you all. <laughs>